So SACS is starting with calcium for step one. Why calcium? So this little thing here is meant to be when something crosses organ systems and subdivisions of all the electrolytes, you know, more than sodium, potassium, calcium shows up everywhere. And calcium, it's a clue. When they're, when they're giving you abnormalities of calcium, they're telling a story. Everything is a story. Data is a story. You just have to kind of connect the dots and think of it in those terms. So calcium is part of a story in multiple organ systems. A lot of this isn't headline news, but it's to kind of lead. Everything is kind of builds to its crescendo. So that's what we are here. So what's the principal regulator of calcium? Parathyroid, right? The parathyroid hormone. Where does parathyroid hormone come from? The parathyroid glands. Where, you know, parathyroid, where they're located? Behind the thyroid. This is not headline news to anybody, but we'll show you how they use that in a little while, right? What, what are the cells in the parathyroid that elaborate parathyroid hormone? The chief or principal cells. So parathyroid gland, how does it know if and when to secrete hormone to regulate calcium? And it's got these sensors, the calcium sensing receptors. It's because it's gonna to respond to what, right? Hypocalcemia, it's gonna stimulate PTH release, hypercalcemia inhibits. You know this, right? Hypercalcemia inhibits PTH release. All right, so how and where does PTH regulate calcium? And there are three sites where it works, bone, kidney, intestine. PTH has an indirect effect on which of the three organs and the answer. And, and by the way, when I do these rhetorical questions up here, they're not for me. They're really for you to just stop and, and think for a second. Wait a minute, like direct or indirect on parathyroid. Well, I know it works on the bone. I know it works in the kidney. Intestine, is there a parathyroid receptor in the intestine? None that I'm aware of. What happens in the intestine, right? Parathyroid increases vitamin D and it's vitamin D that increases calcium and phosphate absorption. So parathyroid doesn't work directly on the gut, but the gut is part of the whole calcium metabolism story, as we'll see as we move toward the malabsorptive states. All right, so let's focus on the kidney. Now here, same thing. It you know, does two different actions in the proximal convoluted tubule, one in the distal convoluted tubule. Hmm, what does it do in the proximal convoluted tubule? So here's in the proximal convoluted tubule, what does PTH do? It interferes with the sodium phosphate pump, right? That's an ATPase dependent uh, channel. So PTH has a direct role on that by decreasing phosphate absorption, right? So low phosphate is part of hyperparathyroidism. It causes phosphaturia. And and the goal of not absorbing phosphate, it is free up ionized calcium. So free calcium from phosphate. That makes sense. So we're getting rid of phosphate. That's one of the actions of PTH in the proximal convoluted tubule. I told you it was sodium potassium ATPase dependent pump where P, cyclic AMP is involved. The only relevance of that is in patients with hyperparathyroidism. It's an older test, but you'll see this urinary cyclic AMP can be uh, determined. So you can do a urinary cyclic AMP level as part of the diagnostic uh, process of hyperparathyroidism. It's, a, it's an old test, honestly, not really used, but they don't care about what's used or not because what they're doing is testing the principle about your understanding second messengers with hormones and the generation of cyclic AMP in that process. That's where urinary cyclic AMP will ultimately matter. Okay. So that's what it does on the proximal convoluted tubule. It interferes with phosphate absorption. That's one action. The other thing, as we said, you know, where is this one alpha hydroxylase? Where does it reside? In the proximal convoluted tubule cells, right? So parathyroid directly increases the level of one alpha hydroxylase. What does one alpha hydroxylase do? Converts calcidiol to calcitriol, right? 25 hydroxy to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, and that's going to be the active form of the hormone. Okay, so that's the second thing parathyroid does at the level of the kidney. And again, so it's that vitamin D and the effects on the intestine that leads to increased calcium. A little more complicated in the distal convoluted tubule. You know, I alluded to these were indirect. One is to get rid of phosphate to increase calcium indirect. The second, increase calcium absorption by way of vitamin D. In the distal convoluted tubule, it's actually a direct effect. It stimulates calcium reabsorption uh, via transcellular channels. 
And to tell you the truth, that's really all you need to know in terms of mechanisms. I include mechanisms just to help you think about, well, why is this happening? So, I mean, it does a couple of things. And one of the things it does, it directly stimulates the sodium uh, calcium transporter, increases sodium intracellularly, and in the process extrudes calcium. So it just stimulates calcium absorption that way. The other thing it's thought to do is to inhibit the sodium chloride transporter. And by doing that, again, it decreases intracellular calcium and it's a secondary effect to increase calcium absorption. They don't ask you, you don't need to know it at that level where this is gonna come up in, in about two seconds when we talk about thiazide direct, diuretics and how they cause hypercalcemia. So you just need to know though, PTH, indirect proximal, has a direct mechanism in the distal convoluted tubule. Alrighty, so we have the gut and we have the kidney, vitamin D, it's everywhere. Vitamin D is everywhere and uh, lots of torture coming on that before this day is over. All right, so what does it do on bone, right? So remember, hypocalcemia, PTH is gonna stimulate bone to increase uh, blood calcium levels. In reality, the quick response is there's this bone fluid in the canalicular network in bone. I mean, it's just sitting there waiting to be used. So PTH stimulates this mobilization of calcium from this bone fluid. This is immediate, the calcium phosphate salts in the canalicular network. Now I'm gonna ask you that. You just need to know parathyroid increases serum calcium level. That's where it's coming from in the bone. The whole separate curriculum is what does parathyroid hormone do on the bone? right? That's what they care about. And it's that slow release, the stimulation of the osteoblast. Again, when you see some Ben Franklin's here, this is money. It just means it's obviously, it means it's not going away. So what do you need to know? Parathyroid hormone stimulates the osteoblast, right? And that expresses right rank ligand. The pre-osteoclast has the rank receptor and the two, you know, kind of mate and you wind up with differentiation and activation of the osteoclast, right? So the PTH stimulates the osteoblast with secondary effect on the osteoclast. And I just want to emphasize, because I have to be contemporary, you know, this is the 90s or whatever year it is, right? So the osteoclast doesn't have PTH receptors. They communicate through social media. The social media happens to be rank ligand, rank receptor, okay? How does that play out? Here's applied histology. This is what they do with histology, right? Here's a bone uh, metabolic unit, right? Here you have the leading edge, right? We're remodeling bone. It looks like a mellow bone here. You have osteoclasts here on one end. You have to be able to recognize those. We'll cover that in bone. Um, you have osteoblasts sitting on top of osteoid here in the trailing edge. And the, the question is straightforward. Where does PTH work? Well, first you have to be able to identify an osteoblast versus osteoclast, and then you have to remember PTH works to stimulate the osteoblast. Boom, applied histology, that's how they do it. Osteoblast just being osteoblast, right? Okay, that was easy. That's another question, not on the exam, but NBME likes. All right, so that's it. Though that's the people involved in um, calcium homeostasis, homeostasis, parathyroid, we have bone, kidney, intestine, and the relation to vitamin D. Last regulator, so there was a period of time where I was trying to draw slides and stuff like that. And some of them are just too legendary to get rid of. And of course, this is a classic. So what do we have here? Just, you know, standard diet, yogurt, took in 1500 milligrams a day. In majority, you lose uh, the dietary sources in the, in the feces, but calcitriol can increase your uh, absorption. And a small amount is lost in the urine. Uh, of our dietary consumption and that part is regulated, right? So we talked about that, PTH, vitamin D. So what about the role of calcitonin? The key thing on calcitonin, we understand that that reduces calcium, but in our bodies and in reality, it's really a minor regulatory role. So don't count on calcitonin to do much in terms of um, controlling serum calcium levels. It's a very transient effect as we see, uh, as we'll see at the end, as we talk about treatment. Howdy mates, I went nuts in the live lecture on these next few slides. I'm gonna just cut in and do them over and do them quickly and straightforward. The main place you're gonna see calcitonin mentioned is in the setting of medullary thyroid carcinoma. And when they're mentioning medullary thyroid carcinoma, they are doing it in the setting of the MEN uh, syndromes, MEN2A, 2B. Medullary thyroid carcinoma is gonna travel with veocorbocytoma. 2A will also have hyperparathyroidism in the form of hypercalcemia. 2B is the marfanoid features. I've done previous recordings on the MEN syndromes. I will not digress at this point. The emphasis in this presentation is on calcitonin as a calcium regulator. 
This information is extremely low yield. They're not apt to ask, but while we're in the neighborhood, should they inquire about the mechanism by which calcitonin does lower uh, serum calcium levels, it is by decreasing osteoclast activation. That is the mechanism, and again, it is a transient effect. It also decreases renal absorption, unimportant. One of the places you may see calcitonin mentioned is in treatment of hypercalcemia. Given the transient effect, rebound is common after 48 hours of use. Um, so it will be listed as an acute treatment for hypercalcemia, uh, but short-lived. There are other therapies that we'll be covering. The one other place you may see calcitonin mentioned, historically we did use it for management of osteoporosis, but it was essentially only a minimally effective agent. The one other point that comes up from students related to calcitonin is in the MEN two-way syndromes, right? You have hyperparathyroidism and you have high calcitonin level. So what are we going to see? High serum calcium or low serum calcium? And the answer is hypercalcemia. The effect of uh, PTH far outweighs uh, those of calcitonin. So the uh, MEN two A syndromes with um, medullary thyroid carcinoma, uh, elaborating calcitonin versus hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the hyperparathyroidism trumps, and we will see hypercalcemia. And that completes it for this review of the calcium regulators. We're going to get into the disorders in the following section.